So I'm going to get started. Uh, welcome, everyone, to RubyConf. Hope you guys are having a good time so far. I am. Um, I'm going to be talking about Ruby and Go and how you can use both of the language to, languages together inside the Ruby VM to write fast Ruby code. Um, but first, I'm going to tell you about who I am once I get my thing working here. All right, cool. So who am I? Uh, my name is Lauren Siegel. I have a Twitter account and a blog that I occasionally update. You could follow me, uh, check out what I write about random things. Um, I've been working on a bunch of different things over the last couple years. Uh, tools for Ruby, tools for the cloud. I was working on games for a little bit. And most recently, I am working on music tooling at Splice. So that means I've been working with a lot of different languages, uh, a lot of different technologies. Ruby, JavaScript, C Sharp, Go, Objective-C, uh, TypeScript, all this, all this fun stuff. So um, lots of different languages. And so I figured I would take that opportunity to sort of share with you some of my experience using two of my favorite languages, which is uh, Ruby and Go. So let's start with Ruby. Um, Ruby is, I guess, for the purposes of this talk, uh, slow and inefficient. Um, but it's, it's a beautiful language. I like it a lot. It's, it is my favorite language. Um, but it is definitely slower than, than Go. And um, I could definitely talk more about Ruby and tell you all the awesome stuff and all the, the bad stuff. But, um, we're here at RubyConf. Hopefully, a lot of you guys are already Ruby developers. If you're not, there's plenty more at RubyConf to like learn about Ruby and stuff like that. So I'm going to sort of skip this little Ruby tidbit part and just talk about the language you may not know much about, which is Go. So Go is uh, fast and simple. We kind of know it as, as, a, as a, this simple language that's, that is also as fast as C. Um, but uh, that's about it. Um, well, okay, not really. Um, there's, there's more to Go than just the, the fast and simple part of Go. Uh, Go actually has a bunch of different features. It has structural typing. It has a really fast garbage collector. It has interoperability with C, so you can write systems-level type programming with Go. It has a really good concurrency story. It has really fast performance and a very simple grammar, as, as, as I just mentioned. Um, but the, the key thing, if, if, if you guys haven't seen Go and are sort of just learning it now, the key thing to really understand about Go, I think, in my opinion, is, is the structural typing portion of Go. And I think that's really what fundamentally makes Go it, uh, the language itself. Um, and so it's, it's, this is a bit of a simplification, but you could basically think of Go as a language with two features. Um, the sort of the structs and types that declare data and the functions that define behavior for that data. And if you look at Go this way, it makes it a lot easier to sort of understand how code is, is set up if you, start, if you first start reading it. Uh, and you might ask sort of like, doesn't every language have code and, and data separate? Um, and that's, that's true, but in Go, the separation is much more explicit. So, uh, for example, in an object-oriented language like Ruby, when we define a class, we define a class with, uh, as a module with uh, methods inside of it, and also occasionally we'll put attribute accessors inside of it. And all that stuff is sort of in one big bundle. And in fact, when we define attribute accessors, they're really just method calls. So there really isn't even a differentiation between where the data lives and how the data behaves. So, um, that, that's sort of how Ruby works. And in Go, what you actually have is uh, these, these struct types. So on the left, you see the, uh, the, the person struct up top. And you see that it's defining the, just the person structure as data. And it's not really caring about how it behaves. It's just defining the attributes that define a person. And that's all. And so uh, that's how structures are defined. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you could kind of see how functions operate on the data. So we might have functions that 
that are just class level type functions that just perform data on, on no specific struct. Or you might have a function at the bottom half over there where you would have something more like an instance method in Ruby where you're operating on, the, on, a, on a type. Uh, but these are defined separately. And, and if you think about these separately, oops, uh, we have a problem. Sorry about that. I got to make my computer not go to sleep. OK. Um, so uh, you can basically have, uh, if, uh, you can have functions and you can have structs. And uh, sort of understanding these two things sort of gets you 80% way there in Go. And the reason it gets you 80% the way there in Go is because there are no other major abstractions in the language. This is basically it. I mean, there's, there's a couple of other sort of syntactic sugars for, for, uh, for asynchronous behavior. But this is pretty much the entirety of the syntax of the language. So if you understand this part of Go, you pretty much understand most of it, which is good for us. And it's also good for the tool that I wrote, which basically looks at these structure definitions. So we'll see that, we'll see why that matters in a bit. Um, there's obviously more you can learn about Go. You can go read all these, uh, these websites. There's, there's a good tour on Golang that you guys can read through if you want to learn more about Go. I'm not going to dive too deep into the language. Um, but you can go read about it and learn about all the little uh, bits and pieces of Go. It has a good playground on the website, so you can go play with it in the browser. You don't have to install it on your machine if you want to learn Go. It's kind of fun. Um, but the, the problem here is that uh, so Go is like it's a fast language. It's, it's meant for like business use cases. It's like a real language. Um, so uh, to me, that's kind of boring. I don't really care about that. The, I mean, I'm, I'm in it for this. I'm in it for the, for the toys, right? So what I really like about Ruby is the fact that it's, it's, such a, it's, it's a language that you can manipulate and play with and sort of um, bring, to the ed, bring to the edge and, and sort of um, do really weird things with, right? Because it, the language is so expressive that you can do so many things with Ruby. And that's sort of what drives me as a programmer uh, to, to a language like Ruby. Um, so I want to tell you guys a little story about what got me to writing this tool called, called Gorb. Um, and uh, basically what happened was a couple months ago, I was um, relearning Go. I, had, uh, I, was, I was about to start using it professionally for, for a while. And um, I was relearning Go. And I was, I, was writing, I was writing a lot of Ruby at the time, so I sort of, uh, writing Go, relearning Go, and also trying to write Ruby code. Uh, I was writing Go and then also realizing how much of Go, how much of Ruby is missing in Go and how much more I like Ruby than Go. And it was really bothering me. Uh, I couldn't stop, couldn't stop thinking about writing Ruby code. So uh, I, I knew that Go was the right tool for the job here. So I, I thought of a way that I could write Ruby and Go at the same time um, and also make my Ruby faster by um, making it work uh, with Go. So I decided to write a tool that would help me write faster Ruby code. And in doing so, I would get to learn more about Go and relearn all the Go that I needed to. Uh, and I was going to call this tool Gorb. Uh, so Gorb has a GitHub page that you guys can go visit. It uh, is uh, on my, my GitHub slash lsegal slash Gorb. It has examples and a readme and a bunch of code that you can go look at and play with. Um, it's, uh, it's fun. It's, it's, it's sort of, it's very new, so it doesn't really have, it's not complete. There's a lot more stuff to do, so if you want to open pull requests, you totally can. Um, but before you go in and open pull requests, maybe I should tell you more about what Gorb is. Uh, so two things at the top, uh, what Gorb is not. Gorb does not stand for Gorbachev, and, and Gorb does not stand for Gorby Puff. Um, Gorb stands for Go Ruby, and it is basically a tool that lets you write Go, uh, write Go as you would normally write Go, fast Go that you would use in production, and run that fast Go inside of the Ruby VM, and that's pretty much all it is. Uh, so how do we connect a language like Go, how do we actually run Go code inside of Ruby? And uh, the answer to this question is, is a thing called native extensions. 
So native extensions are a way for uh, Ruby to sort of load machine code or C code or dynamic libraries into the Ruby VM and allow you to run that machine code as if it were part of the Ruby sort of world. Um, and so that's how sort of MySQL gems or other you know, native integrations work, is basically have a bunch of C code that just gets thrown into the Ruby VM. That way you can interact with your operating system or do weird things that are uh, usually not available to the Ruby world. So uh, Gorb takes advantage of native extensions to do this. Uh, native extensions, at least in MRI, and MRI is, is the Ruby that we use and know, not, not JRuby, not Rubinius. Uh, the Ruby, I will, uh, whenever I say Ruby now, I'll, I'm talking about MRI specifically. Um, Ruby is written in C, and Ruby's API is known as CRuby. It is basically the code that drives the Ruby implementation, the API that drives Ruby itself. This is what some of the Ruby implementation looks like. This is a, just a snippet from the Ruby source code. This is the C Ruby that you would typically see if you were reading through Ruby's code. Um, C Ruby is C code, uh, which means that writing C Ruby is hard because writing C is hard. And um, we don't want to typically have to write C code when we are writing as programmers. I mean, I don't like C. Um, a lot of people are not necessarily comfortable and familiar with C these days. It's not exactly the easiest language to use. Uh, so stuff like this is not exactly easy to read or maintain or write. You have to deal with macros, especially in the C Ruby API. A lot of macros, macros are fun to use. They're complicated. They have lots of problems. Um, you have to deal with your own memory management, which is problematic if you're not experienced in memory management, manual memory management. You have to deal with compiler issues. Ruby's uh, MKMF native extension helper stuff deals with a lot of that for you, but there's still always going to be some kind of compiler issue that you're going to run into when you're dealing with cross-platform C extensions. So that stuff isn't fun. And finally, it doesn't help that the C Ruby API itself, the documentation isn't exactly the best documentation out there mostly because a lot of this stuff doesn't actually get touched a lot. Um, so you're often finding edge cases in the documentation. It's not, not fun. So um, it would be great if we can write fast, fast code that was uh, used by a native extension but didn't have to worry about C. Um, and so writing Go is definitely easier than writing C in my experience. Um, but the problem is that if we're writing Go, we're still writing C because we need to use the C Ruby API to connect our Go to, as a native extension to, to Ruby's VM. And that is not easy. So uh, as an example, this is, uh, this is what some of the output that Gorb spits out for you is. This is a wrapper function, this is a wrapper method for a method called isPrime, which basically just calculates whether a method, whether a number is prime, it takes one input number and it spits out a true or false value. This is like 10 lines of code to, and it, to, to wrap this function. And there, the implementation is actually not here. The implementation's in another file, the actual implementation for is prime. So this is only the wrapper code to let you use this inside of Ruby. And this is like 10 lines of code. And imagine doing this for 10 methods, for 20 methods, for complex methods that take blocks, raise exceptions, parse multiple arguments, parse a var argument. This stuff gets complicated really fast. Um, so Gorb simplifies this by basically automating away that problem. It'll automatically generate these wrappers for you, and that's what Gorb does. The goal here is to write this on the left-hand side, just your regular Go code, and have Gorb generate for you the implementation details. And basically, it lets you use it from Ruby as if you were using regular Ruby and running the Go code on the left-hand side, not worrying about anything on that right-hand side on that screen. And the great thing is that you're writing Go code, so the code is fast. Um, how fast, you ask? Well, um, so there's this little benchmark in the examples. Uh, this is a very small micro-benchmark that is obviously a micro-benchmark. 
Um, and you can get, basically, you can get 10x speeds. You can get faster than 10x speeds um, by, by using Go. It's, it's not that surprising, because we know that Go is C level fast. It's, it's as, almost as fast as C. Um, so it's not surprising that we're getting these kinds of speeds from, from Go. Um, but it is interesting if you think about it, if you do have problems in the real world, um, I'm, you, know, you have these, these bottlenecks, CPU bottlenecks, it is interesting to think that you can actually write Go code that is easier to maintain than C, actually maintainable, you know, easy to write, easy to read, but still get that performance benefit from Ruby. Um, so I am now going to sort of jump into a demo here to, to show you guys what this code looks like. Um, so if I could get this to work. I'm going to have to move this onto the screen. Let's see. OK. So I have Gorb running inside of a Docker image here. Uh, there's a Docker image in the repo. If you pull down the repo, you get a, a, a Docker file that you can build and run so you don't have to worry about setting up Go or setting up Ruby. It's all there for you. Um, and Gorb has a command called, oh no, why did my keyboard stop working? That's great. Oh no, technical difficulties. Oh, wait, I, know, I think I know what it is. I didn't. Um, let's try this again. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, okay. We can fix this. We have the tools. Uh, so I'm just going into my Go repo directory here. Uh, and so there's a start Docker thing. Hopefully this works. Hopefully Docker didn't just die and I have to restart Docker. OK, I'm going to restart Docker. Let's see what happens. Sorry about that. Um, oh, great. <laughs> Let's see if this works. There we go. Yes. OK, sweet. All right. <laughs> you don't have to clap now. <laughs> I didn't do anything. All right. Um, so as I said, I'm inside of a Docker image here. Uh, let's just get this window not weird. OK. Um, and so Gorb has a command called gorbgen. And gorbgen basically is the command that generates these wrapper files for you. Uh, so you basically pass a, pa a Go package to gorbgen, and it'll spit out uh, code that can be, can be compiled as a native extension in Ruby. And you could load that from Ruby. Uh, before I generate code, I might as well show you guys what some of the code that we will be generating for is. Uh, so here's our Fibonacci example that I had before. Um, and uh, here we go. Uh, so here's a Fibonacci example that we had before. This is basically the code that was powering that, that benchmark that I showed you. And this is the actual benchmark code that we are running with the Ruby version up top. And uh, as you can see, so what we did is we created a struct that, that Gorb will then turn into a class for us. And we attach a method onto the struct called fib that basically performs the necessary math, math, math functions for us. Uh, and then from Ruby, what we're, all we're doing is we're loading up the, we're loading up the, the, the library as, as if it were regular Ruby code, and then just calling Fibonacci.new, because it's imported as a class inside of Ruby. So we now have a class, and then we just call the fib method, which basically calls out to Go. So that's, that, is, that is actually calling Go from, from Ruby right there. Um, so if I were to call gorb gen test slash fib, that's where the file, that's where the package is relative to my current directory. Uh, I can generate the file. I can also build the file, so it'll automatically build the native extension for us in one step. You don't have to go to Ruby and do make and all that magic. It'll automatically do that for us. So it has now built that SO file. And we can actually use that SO file directly. So if I were to require 
x slash test slash fib slash fib, that's where that SO file lives on disk. Uh, we now have this module, oops, uh, test fib. There's, our, there's the module and there's, this is a class that we, fib, uh, there's the class that we generated and we can create a new one. We can call fib on it, oops. We can call fib on it. There we go. So you can this is and this is calling out directly to Go code that is that, that we compiled. Um, so that's that's sort of what uh, that's sort of how you how you would use Gorb. This is sort of what the code that is generated looks like. So as I mentioned, it, it gets kind of unwieldy fast. Uh, this is what you would have to write if you were writing this yourself. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of boilerplate here for, um, we have that is prime method that's just there for fun. So, so there's, there's that is prime example up top. Uh, but this is the Fibonacci code. So you have boilerplate for the, creating the structure for the class. You have boilerplate for like allocating the class and, and creating an object, a Go object for you and keeping track of that. And then you actually have the, the method, uh, Fib method over here down, top, down at the bottom um, that actually calls out to the Fib function. So all that stuff is generated for you and all that stuff is compiled for you. You don't have to worry about any of it. This is the boilerplate for actually hooking this up to Ruby and telling Ruby that we have this method called isPrime. We also have a class called Fibonacci and we have this method on the, the Fibonacci class called fib. So all this stuff is hooked up for us. We don't have to worry about it. This is what Gorb does for us and we just have to worry about code. So let's look at more, more code. Um, for example, this is, um, we can look at code that does HTTP stuff. So if you wanted to write an HTTP server, or uh, I wanted to write an HTTP uh, sort of app uh, that, that runs on HT over, over the web, you can use Go's HTTP web server if you wanted to uh, and just serve, met serve bodies from that Go HTTP server. So this is an implementation of just a regular sort of like rack style application that is hosted on slash gorb at some address, uh, and it basically, this Go code will return uh, a body back to us to, as, as a user. Uh, and this is the actual implementation. So uh, we, we call serve, which calls this method up top. Uh, we give it an address to, to bind to, so we are, are binding to 8080, and then we give it a callback, and Gorb is smart enough to turn these uh, callback functions into blocks for us. So we get a nice block down here in, in Ruby, and we can then perform stuff in Ruby. And then we have this little uh, client method. I think we have a, a client. So I, I wrote this little client application that basically starts a server and sends a request to that server for us. So we'll run this little, we'll, we'll run this little program here and uh, see what happens. Oops. Okay. So. So I don't need to generate this stuff. I, I generated a lot of these programs already, so we're, we will just run the, the HTTP server example. So this is gonna start the client, start the server, send a request from the client, get back the result, and as you see, so there's no smoke and mirror magic here. Uh, we can make modifications to the Ruby code. We don't have to recompile the Go because all, all the work that we're doing in, on, on our side is, is happening in Ruby. So we could say hello RubyConf, rerun this code, and Go will serve our new HTTP page for us. And all the, all the serving of the HTTP is happening from Go. So uh, that's, what, that's, that's uh, HTTP stuff. You can, also do, uh, you can also do fun stuff with arrays. So you can mutate arrays. So you can reverse arrays, you can do all this fun stuff in, in Go that you would do, so you could take an array. Uh, and writing Go code, just like regular Go code, you would sort of reverse an array, maybe not exactly like this, but you would reverse an array, something like this, you would return it back to your, your Go library as if, as if it was just regular Go code, and we can have this turn it into a mutable array on the Ruby side. Um, and so if we were to run this example, So 
So we get the output of, we reverse an array, we have a mutable string array at the, the second example, we can basically modify the array, add, it, add an element to the end, maybe change one in the middle, and then we can also do the same thing with integers. Uh, and that code down here is, as you see, basically we're passing in an array over here. This, this list in Go gets turned into an array in Ruby, and then we print the result back inside of Go, and you can see that Go has, has the modified Ruby array. Same thing for mutating lists, and uh, you can see down here, uh, we have an array of integers. We multiply every integer by five, and then we print the result from the Go side, and we see that we were able to mutate it. So a bunch of things that you can do with GORB. Um, lots, of, lots of fun things you can do with GORB. Let me talk more about how sort of it works. Um, so we saw that basically it, what it does is it generates wrappers for you. Uh, and basically how that works is you give GORB a bunch of Go source files. GORB will then turn those source files into wrapper functions that we saw, that all that messy CRuby stuff. Uh, you, you will then automatically, GORB will automatically then throw that stuff into Go and compile that stuff using Go's CRuby, CGO uh, support. So it'll compile a dynamic library for you. And all that stuff will happen and it'll generate a native extension, which Ruby can then load. Uh, the important part is really just this part because the rest of it sort of happens, that's all just Go stuff that happens as you would build a, a dynamic library normally with Go. That's all just regular Go stuff. So the important part is sort of the part where we generate these wrapper files. So uh, the way that GORB generates these wrapper files is sort of this little four-step compiler type process. It's sort of a transpiler, if you would think. It, it takes one type of code, it turns into another type of code. Um, so it's kind of a compiler tool. And in being a compiler tool, the first step is always to parse the AST, or the abstract syntax tree. Uh, this is typically something that a compiler, uh, a compiler will use to sort of understand the, 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 little, the pieces of your program. So it'll take the text of your Go code, it'll turn it into this big tree that has all the little bits of your program inside this tree that it can iterate over. Uh, and we will take that AST and actually use it to read the source code. So we take that AST and we basically read, find all the functions, find all the structures, and, uh, and, and keep track of everything. So we have a structure up top uh, which has three attributes, and we keep track of those attributes. Again, as I mentioned, because Go is separating these data types from the functions, it's very easy for us to detect what is, a, what is an attribute, what's a function, and separate them out. So we go in and re we read all the functions, we read all the structs, uh, and we create our own internal representation. So we keep track of all the attributes, all their types, all the functions, all the arguments, all the return types, uh, everything we need to generate code. And then we go ahead and we just spit out a bunch of, uh, bunch of Go code. And this part is just basically using templates, sort of like ERB style templates, we basically just uh, generate a function. We, you, could, you could sort of see little bits and pieces of the structure in, in the outputted code. So we had three attributes at the top of RGB. And you could see here that it's, this is part of the code that generates the attributes for the RGB attributes, uh, for the RGB, RGB fields in, in Go. And so you have the setter up, up top, which basically sets the value. And then you have the G getter and setter functions that basically get and set the value inside of Ruby. And you can see little bits and pieces of the RGBG uh, and the int value conversion happening. So uh, that's sort of how, how GORB sort of co-gens all this stuff for you. Once we have those, those Go files, they can be compiled into native extensions. You just have to you do like go build uh, dash T. There's, there's a couple of command flags, but it's mostly just go build and it'll give you a native extension that you can then load directly into Ruby. So uh, GORB is not a complete implementation. It's, it has plenty of limitations and uh, flaws. Um, one of them is the limited concurrency support. That's not exactly Go GORB's problem, but it's, it's the fact that Ruby has a gill. 
uh, the interpreter lock, as, as Matt talked about. Um, basically, what happens is you can do Go, you can do Go routine, you can do concurrency stuff inside of Go, you can do all this fancy multi-threading stuff inside of Go, but unfortunately, because of the gil, you can only talk to Ruby from the main thread. So anything that you want to do, anything that you want to send back to Ruby, has to happen in a synchronized main thread. And unfortunately, that's, that can be a limitation to a lot of Go programs. So that's definitely a limitation. Um, it only has basic block support. So, um, uh, so you can't really do fun funky things with blocks in Ruby. You can't like t store them as procs and use them later. That's not really supported by Gorb. There's a lot of weirdness around how, how blocks might raise exceptions, which isn't necessarily supported by Gorb. Um, there's also uh, mutable array types aren't necessarily supported because Go is a typed language. Uh, every single type is a separate type, so an array of strings is different from an array of integers, and Gorb doesn't support the entire gamut of every single possibility yet. So what actually happens is it only supports arrays of strings, integers, and bools, and anything else you're kind of on your own right now. Um, it doesn't have mapping from hashes in Ruby to maps in Go or vice versa. It can't really export standard library types, so if you had this uh, HTTP server and you wanted to return the entire HTTP.response struct from Go into Ruby, Gorb can't really do that automatically. If you wanted to do that, you can wrap it inside of a Go, your own Go struct that took bits and pieces of that, of that response struct and returned them to, to Ruby separately, but it can't really return the full thing. That's something that could be added, just it doesn't support it yet. Um, and similarly, there's no great cross-package support story. So like, you can use stuff across packages, but it's hard to export them uh, necessarily to, to Ruby. Uh, and it, it's, that's fine. It's, it's fine that there are these limitations, because the, the goal here wasn't to write a, a Go, a Ruby to Go wrapper type thing. The goal here for me was I started this just trying to learn more about Go. So I was just writing a toy, and I ended up with a toy. So it is a toy. You could play with it. There's definitely stuff you can do with it, but it really is, at the end of the day, just a toy. Um, and in being a toy, I figured I'd mention some real world alternatives. If you're interested in this kind of thing of like writing fast code inside of Ruby, um, there's stuff like SWIG, which stands for Simplified Wrapper Interface Generators. This is basically like a, a C++ answer to this problem. C, uh, SWIG supports converting C or C++ libraries into Ruby or uh, Perl or Python, it has support for a ton of different languages. It basically does the exact same thing, but for C libraries. So if you were writing a C library, you can do this. Uh, you can use Swig. Um, I was writing a Go library, so Swig doesn't really apply here. But um, there are ways you can make that work if you wanted to. There's FFI, which stands for Foreign Function Interfaces. Uh, you might have seen foreign function interfaces in places. It's sort of a way to dynamically call out to functions in, in Ruby to, to native dynamic libraries. Uh, like the MySQL gem might have FFI bindings or other gems. Um, it would be great to use something like FFI, but the problem for me is that it's just a no-go because it has no Go involved. I wouldn't be actually writing Go code. I would just be writing uh, Ruby code, and that kind of defeats the purpose for, at least for what I was trying to do. And the, the point here is that it wasn't really about, um, it wasn't really about getting an end-to-end -end solution for me. It was really about um, practice. So I looked at this tool for me as just a way for me to write a toy and sort of gain experience. And for me, writing toys, playing with toys, Using toys is really about practicing your craft and getting better and learning. Um, and that's sort of what I think is important with, with these tools and toys that we, we work on is uh, all these things sort of teach us something about the language we're learning or the tool or the, or the framework we're learning. Um, and at least for me, when I'm writing a Hello World program in a new language or a new, new framework, I'm usually looking at automation tools as my answer for a Hello World program. I'll automate some email uh, sending thing or some alarm clock system. Or, um, that, that's what I usually look to. 
Um, people occasionally ask me sort of like what I'm learning Rust in my spare time. And uh, I'm, doing it, I'm doing it outside of work, so I don't really have any like real world things to do with this programming language. What should I write? Um, and for me, the thing that always comes back is sort of automation. You should find some repetitive task in your day-to-day -day life, an email that you always have to send your boss, uh, uh, an email that you always have to send your friend, a, a Facebook link that you'd never want to click, or something like that. Um, and find a way to sort of automate that and learn your tool by, by there's your problem right there, just automate it. Um, for me, automation is kind of our job description as software developers. I feel like our goal is just to automate things uh, and, and figure out how to, how to make things work better without us actually doing anything. Um, so uh, there's always a use case for automating something. And not only will you actually be able to learn uh, a new language or a new tool or a new framework, but you'll also be able to be better at your craft as a software developer because uh, automation is really important to, to pretty much everything we do. So you're always picking up different, different uh, techniques, different uh, things. You're learning a bunch of different things besides just the, the, the language or framework that you're learning. So it's kind of like a two birds, one stone type thing. Uh, so you can, I, I, would, I would recommend that if, if you're in my situation where you're trying to learn this new language, uh, practice automating something. Just take some problem, go automate it, in that language. You can automate anything. Uh, you can automate, um, if, if you like this talk you, and you like the idea of this talk, you could take Lua, plug it into Ruby. Um, you could take Ruby, plug it into Python if you want to. Um, you could pick any language, really. You don't even have to pick a language. You could pick anything and plug it into any other thing. Uh, you could do the opposite. Um, you can even automate cooking uh, if you wanted to. Um, the, the point here is that take tools, take toys, use them for practice. Create something, uh, play with toys, play with tools, use them as practice. That's kind of like what the reason for me for, was for me for creating a tool called Gorb. So um, I, um, thank you for letting me share that with you guys. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, how do channels in Go get represented in Ruby? So Gorb does not export channels. Um, the idea here would be uh, that you would sort of abstract the channel uh, either through a block that would get called and then sent sent to a channel internally, or just an integer, or just a function that would gen send to a channel and then return back to Ruby. Uh, and then you would do sort of the work behind the scenes. Um, there is the problem with, again, concurrency. You can't really do complex concurrency stories inside of Ruby just because of the gill. So um, even if I did export channels directly to, to, to Ruby, which is theoretically possible, you could just export a channel as some kind of object that you can send to, um, it still would be complex because you couldn't actually do any weird, any weird concurrency stuff anyway. So um, it, it's something that could be supported, but it's like, uh, it's, it's complex to actually support in a real world case. You'll most likely, as Matt said, end up crashing Ruby by trying to do something weird with, with concurrency in Go, in, in Ruby. Uh, at least from the main thread in Ruby. You can definitely do stuff behind the scenes. You can do the, the, good, the good use case, sorry, the good use case for that is like workers. So you could spawn a worker thread or that runs in the background and then every time Ruby asks, it does a block and pulls and pulls back. But it's still processing in the background in a separate thread. So that would be a kind of a good use case for concurrency. But uh, yeah, it, it kind of gets hairy when you're pulling that, that abstraction back into Ruby. Uh, yeah, I, I would say a, a worker queue would be a great example of that. So you basically pump stuff in from the Ruby side, just like have a method that just takes an argument, like a string, uh, pushes that into the channel as an abstraction. Ruby doesn't even know that it's a channel gets processed inside of a queue in the background, and then you know, Ruby either can pull or, um, or it can just call a block back when it's done or something like that, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, 
So Go has a runtime, but Go's runtime is embedded into the binary. So, uh, sorry, the question was, uh, uh, when you compile a Go program, the SO file, uh, is Go involved or is it just C code at that point? And the answer is uh, there, there is a Go runtime that's embedded in the binary, so it's not actually calling out to like Go on your system or anything. You don't need Go on your system. It's, it is calling Go code. There is like a Go runtime and there's garbage collection happening and there's uh, other sort of stuff that's happening in the background in that process but that's all sort of embedded in the binary. So you end up with this SO file that is effectively machine code, but it includes a lot of Go stuff in, in it as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, what's the question? Yeah, so uh, when, things break, when things break in the Go wrapper code or uh, inside of the runtime, is it difficult to track down problems? Is that, that's the question. Uh, so yeah, uh, I mean, depending on the problem, if it happens at compile time, it's usually pretty easy. You'll get like some weird exception that just panic, Go will just panic and say, I can't generate this file. And there's a lot of, as you mentioned, there's a lot of edge cases where just Gorb doesn't handle. There's obviously work to be done to like make it handle it more appropriately. Um, but it'll, it'll panic. Um, and uh, if, if in that case, it'll just panic. In the Ruby case, it'll probably just like do the, the Ruby style C crash where it just dumps the entire stack for you, like the C stack, and it'll say like something bad happened. Um, and in that case, it's harder to track down because you don't really have like what happened. Um, so it, it's, it can occasionally be complicated uh, to, to track down, but that's something that can be improved. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, thank you guys very much.